Hey, it's Boober. I'm a Canadian distiller. Today I'll be introducing you to Mad Lab Distillery and we'll be focusing on their very interesting continuous fermentation process. So, let's get to it! Today we're here at Mad Lab Distillery where we'll be looking at their mash and continuous fermentation process. First, 600 kilograms of malt will go through the mill. The mill grain will be collected in bags underneath and altogether it takes three hours to mill all the malt. The hot liquor for the mash is collected in this tank here, as well as in the mash tun. When the distillations are running, the cooling water used in the distillation process is collected in the tank and also in the mash tun itself to be used for mashing in. Roughly 2,000 liters of water is collected, or in other words, two distillations worth of cooling water. The hot liquor is heated to 78 degrees Celsius strike temperature, and there's about 1,200 liters of hot liquor in the mash tun before mashing in. There are 24 bags of milled malt here, and each bag will have to be manually carried all the way to the mash tun by Pat the brewer and Scott the owner of Mad Lab Distillery. Each bag goes up these stairs and is poured into the opening hatch. As you can see, this is quite a strenuous workout. When the grain is added, the rakes are turning at 100%. With the addition of the grain, the temperature will fall to be somewhere between 65 to 70 degrees Celsius. They'll add more water based on how the mash looks. If it looks too thick, then they'll add more hot liquor, somewhere around 600 to 800 liters. They'll Vorloff while running the rakes in the mash tun to make sure everything is well mixed and there's no heat stratification. Heat stratification is the development of relatively stable, warmer and colder layers within a body of water. The rakes in the Vorloff will run for half an hour. Then the rakes are turned off and the Vorloff will continue for another 15 minutes to help clarify the wort further. While that's happening, let's hear from Scott, the owner and head distiller at Mad Lab Spirits here in Vancouver. What inspired you to start a distillery? Uh, you know, I, I'd always found distilling interesting. I had done a lot of, uh, sort of, got involved with some hobby distilling uh, way back when I first started working in the bar industry when I was 19. So I was kind of always around alcohol and a lot of my friends uh, were doing home brewing, doing things like that. Got into it a bit thought it was kind of fun, but I thought I wanted to challenge myself a little bit more. Uh, and so distilling to me just seemed like something that's, you know, I know it's, I know it's doable. It's been, you know, people have been doing it for hundreds of years. So it's not something that's beyond sort of learning how to do. So uh, basically started teaching myself back then. And then, and then when the laws changed around uh, 2013, 2012, 2013, I believe, regarding uh, craft distilling and craft distilling license opened up, I decided uh, it was worth uh, worth giving it a try and and hoping for the best and and we're still here so obviously we're doing something right. Okay. And so would you say it was very difficult to start your distillery? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it's um, you know I've had some people come to me that wanted to start their distillery and and that's awesome. Like that's great. More the merrier. You know, there's lots of room for lots of room for craft distilling. Um, but uh, when, I, when they t sh showed me what they had, they said, okay, well, what's your budget? And they showed it to me and I said, okay, well, multiply that by four and you might be in the ballpark. Because there's just, there was so many unexpected costs, so many ex unexpected licensing issues, engineering issues, you know. We looked at one, at one point we almost had to, it was fortunately we, we just kind of, we were okay, but we might have had to redo all the walls in the entire building to upgrade the fire separation. Uh, it turned out it was okay, uh, but you know, that would have cost us another 80 grand, right? You know, these are these costs that add up and add up and add up. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, is the, is the still the most expensive part? And you, not by a long shot, not by a long shot. No, it's the, the licensing, the engineering, uh, the building, uh, the building upgrades, all those sorts of things 
far outshadow, outshadow the still. Um, you know, that's, you know, it's a, it's a sizable, you know, not for us necessarily, but for like, you know, you have a nice, beautiful copper column still, uh, you know, it's a sizable chunk of your budget, but uh, yeah, and there was uh, just licensing, engineering, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I spent the first year and a bit go leading up to when we opened for the first in a constant state of anxiety and stress it was you know i i i swore i was heading for an ulcer um because it was just you know they call, call us oh well this isn't good enough you have to redo all this it's like oh okay oh my god oh my god and then you do it and, okay that's fixed and then the next thing it's like well you know you need to re-engineer all this so yeah, it's 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 a long and difficult process, and you need kind of deep pockets if you want to do it with as little headache as possible. Uh, you know, for, unfortunately, when we started, the the budget we had was 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 pretty pretty close to zero as possible. So we really had to uh, scrimp and save, and 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 there was a lot of uh, a lot of our own you know blood, sweat, and tears going into the first first while uh, until we kind of got a little bit established and could start getting some cash flow in. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, not not an easy endeavor. If you think, hey, I'm gonna get into distilling, it's gonna be a quick buck. It's the nothing further from the truth, that is. Uh... Thanks, Scott. Now let's get back to the match. We'll start the sparge and the wart collection. Now this is where things get really interesting. The wart travels very slowly from the offtake valve at the bottom of the mash tun and into the IBCs, or intermediate bulk containers. You can see here that three IBCs are set up for the wart collection, and that all three bottom valves are connected by this hose here. You can see that the hose from the mash tun leads into the top of IBC number one only. So the wart that enters will put pressure on the fermenting wash beneath it. This wash will get pushed into IBC number two, which will push the fermenting wash in IBC number two into IBC number three. Since the wart enters IBC number one, this IBC gets diluted most with the wart. So it has the freshest or youngest wash in it. This movement of the wart in the IBCs helps to restart the fermentation process inside all three of them. After five to seven days of fermentation, IBC number one will have fermented to 6% ABV, while IBC number three will have fermented to around 10% ABV. It takes longer for the wash in IBC number one to finish fermenting out since it has been diluted down the most with the fresh wort. The yeast that is being used in the fermentation is a dry champagne yeast, which is a super durable yeast that can ferment within 7 to 35 degrees Celsius so it's stable within a pretty wide temperature range. It's a good thing this yeast is so versatile since, as you can guess, these IBCs here are not temperature regulated. Another thing that's very interesting about Mav Lab's fermentation process is that they have used the same batch of yeast that they started with four years ago. They've only added some additional yeast culture once in four years. Other than that, the yeast culture they're using is basically the same yeast culture that they have been using since day number one, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Since they don't have a lot of space in here, the IBC that has fermented the most dry, which is IBC number three, will be distilled first. At the end of the workday, the heat exchanger is turned off. Since there's no longer any cooling water to cool down the wart, the temperature of the wart that's being collected into the fermenter is warmer. But Scott doesn't see this as an issue since the IBCs are filled with so much cooled wart already. So the heat from the warmer wart will be dissipated by the cooled wart that's already in the IBC. The wart is trickle collected into the IBC until 2,700 liters of wart has been collected in total. It's already 5.30 p.m. and this trickle collection will continue overnight. This trickle collection of wart into the IBC will continue until around 7 a.m. the next day, at which point the pump will be turned back on to maximize wart collection. After that, it will be time to draft out. The draft will be donated to a farmer who comes in about once a week. The IBCs will be left to ferment for five to seven days before the distillation process begins. Scott's distillation process here is extremely unique as he has no copper in his still at all. 
but I'll save that distillation process for another video. I hope you enjoyed learning about the continuous fermentation process at Mad Lab Distillery. There'll be a part two video at Mad Lab where we focus on their no copper distillation setup. So watch out for that one. In the meantime, it would really help me out if you gave this video a thumbs up and left a comment down below. Please hit the subscribe button for more distilling, brewing, and nerdy drink videos. This is Brewbird, sending good vibes your way. I'll see you next time.